Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. All right. <clears throat> Joel Becker. Here. Andy Present. Dan Cater. Here. Scott Gergen. Here. Lisa Hadeen. Here. Russ Roloff. Here. Vince O'Brien. Here. Mr. Gowns. Here. Thank you. Uh, can we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Agenda approved. Motion to approve the minutes of the December 9th regular board meeting and the January 6th organizational board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion on those? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's approved. And the voluminous bills payable from two months. <laughs> yeah, I'll make the motion to pay the bills. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, motion to approve accepting the charitable donations for the second quarter. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Just a big thank you, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many lots thanks. Lots of, lots of good donations. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And a motion to accept the quarterly review of student activities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And we have some terrific news. Yes, some great news, and I just want to call up Spencer Johnson and shake. We don't give you a Cadillac. We don't give you. <laughs> oh, now he's going to storm out. We, we can't even give you a steak out. anymore. <laughs> yeah, don't. No, we can't give you a dog. But uh, <laughs> we definitely, because uh, this is on camera, and, and it does get viewed by the uh, community um, on behalf of the school board. It's a very high recognition. Yeah. Mary Pash is a former recipient mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah. And it's uh, nominations come from your colleagues. Yeah. It's voted upon. And uh, I think that, the, and, I, and I sent Spencer a little card on this. Yeah, the, com the comment that he made, and I think it's true mm -hmm. of what I would like and we as a board would like and uh, out of every teacher, is his real goal is to get kids excited yeah. um, about learning. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not necessarily what they're learning, but you just want them to get pumped up and right. jacked yeah. and excited yeah. and um, we'll do whatever. Learn on their own. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, on behalf of the school board and the community, it's a very high honor. Uh, we congratulate you. Yeah. And if there, we thank you for coming here this evening yeah, as well. Exactly. I mean, you're coming here for a, a, a minute acceptance. I was here anyway because I just took a group of kids fishing. Oh, okay. And we're done. Yeah. I, you know, have, now I have to go get rid of the bait and everything. So, yeah. um, did you catch anything? Oh, I got to show you the picture. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't. Oh. It's a good size. But it's, it's better than that because we had 20, 22 kids, probably four or five parents came, and three three uh, teachers, Andy Valak and Ken Wilson, or Ken... Uh, Okay. The big pike in there? Oh my goodness. Yeah. This little girl caught it. Her dad was there. And then of course hold on. Her dad is there. <laughs> no, he, no, I was Follow up for yeah. yeah, he set it up, didn't he? He did not. I mean he, he let the girl he seriously let the girl <laughs> did do it, you know, and I had to get these other kids to move back because they all want to grab this this line because they think it's theirs, but it's, <laughs> it's his. But then every other kid that was there wanted a picture oh my of goodness. fish. <laughs> so tomorrow I'm going to print 10 pictures of fish for kids to, to take the home. same fish and 10 kids. Exactly. Yeah. That's okay. It's fun. But I do want to say I really appreciate what you guys do, the support I get, the support we all get. Um, I'm really lucky to work here. I've been lucky for the last 29 years to be able to work in this great district and for people to be flexible enough to allow me to teach the way that I do. I do some unorthodox things that um, might be illegal in some districts, but um, it's stop, stop. <laughs> but those are the things that kids remember. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you run into somebody at Walmart, and now I get kids that their dads, well, I, have, I get parents, you know, I had the parents a few years ago and they, they don't forget this stuff. So. That's important. But just the fact also that you're willing to get involved with this group in the after school program yeah. as well. Um, I believe that I've been in there when you've been making fishing lures yeah. and you've been um, showing them how to make that and they're just, yeah. their eyes are, they're just right into it because yeah. um, that's a love and a passion it's for them. It's fun to that. share that passion with so, those kids. So thank you very yes, much. Yes, you're welcome. Very you're much welcome. appreciated. Okay. Thank you. 
And you don't have to stay for the whole board I'm, meeting. I'm so okay. Board meeting. <laughs> All does right. that mean Ken? Does Ken help you out regularly? Ken Wilkins. Yeah. He's starting to. Oh, good. Yeah, That's he loves nice the outdoors, yeah. and uh, he's starting to. Good. Now we've got plenty of time to do it. Yep. Good. And Andy Ballack and Jeremy Reuter and Judy Tui have helped it a lot. Yep. I love that every kid Thank had you. to get a photo of the, with the <laughs> fish. It's <laughs> <That's> a big <laughs> fish. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. yeah. You notice he didn't tell us where he caught this. It's on Lake Rebecca. Oh! It's a middle school oh, analysis. It's not that tricky to find. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. And good news. I don't know if it's the Jen and Mary show or if it's the Jen show, uh, but Jen Reichler, our director of teaching and learning, is here to uh, just share several things with us, uh, curriculum good. review, etc. So take it away, Jen. Thanks for uh, having me here tonight. Whether you knew or not, I'm here. <laughs> um, what I'm doing tonight is just giving a hot topics in teaching and learning, and I'm going to update you on just two things but I will provide opportunity for questions. And at the end, I'd love to hear, is there something next that you'd like to make sure that we share about? So tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about, or I'm gonna talk a little bit about staff development and curriculum review. And we talk uh, specifically about global languages and math who are doing curriculum review right now. So staff development, as I came into staff development, um, came into this job, I love the idea of staff development. Is we have one principal from each building and when I say in most cases at the middle school both Joe and Mark serve on the um, staff development committee so we have a variety of ideas and opinions as we come together and it's really fun to be with that group so what we did as we began this year is we started with building the compelling why which is kind of that message that I'm bringing to each of the groups that I bring together this year why do we do what we do what's the important what are the nuggets that we want to make sure build our foundation so we took some time this year outside of our meetings to um, read some text look at some videos about best practices in staff development and in education because as we do our work we want to continue to make sure that we're doing the right thing and the best thing that we can for our staff which you know when we look at staff development it's in the service of students and their learning and then uh, part of that discussion, we talked about what kind of work should this group continuously come back to. And we landed on four things. We want to support authentic, self-directed learning from our staff. We recognize that people are more invested in their learning if they have some choice. We want to focus on our learning as a team, so we dedicate time at most of our meetings to reflect on some text, whether it's a chapter of a book or an article or a TED Talk, some sort of relevant content so that when we come together, we can model that idea of continuous improvement and learning. We are planning for a continuous feedback loop, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And the other um, big pillar goal for our work is to communicate. So following each meeting, um, the group gets a good set of notes so that they can share with their colleagues when they come back. And then after a few meetings, we put together a whole district email that highlights some of the big ideas that are happening in staff development. So nobody feels out of the loop and they know who their contacts are so they can continue to inform our group's progress. So when we look at staff development, our next steps in here or that we're in right now are some goal setting. And we know that we have some state requirements to set goals, but also goal setting is important as we pave the path for our future work. So one of the things that I'd really like to see staff development as is the hub for all of the, the little spikes that happen in teaching and learning. So when we look at world's best workforce, I'd like to see World's Best Workforce not serve as this separate entity, but inform the work that we have. And Vision 2025, although that's a separate thing, I'd like to weave that in so that we don't have disparate goals hanging out and have a million of them, but really look at what is our, our collective vision. 
So we use World's Best Workforce as a foundation, and we have begun to build some staff development goals. And specifically, we use Vision 2025's academic goal work of college and career readiness. We drafted a list of what does it mean to be college and career ready in Hastings. And we want to make sure that we farm that out to a few groups before that goes public because we don't want it to be a small group of people who have this idea and everybody else thinks we're wacko. We want to make sure that you know it's, it's widely understood. And staff development really appreciated the work that was done and found that, that it would be a good catalyst for our college and career readiness goal under World's Best Workforce. So we're trying to tie in all of those loose ends out there and use staff development as the hub, like I said. So when we look at what's next in staff development, we need to finalize those staff development goals, which will drive those professional development days, things that happen in PLCs, and just the general idea of where we're headed as far as continuous improvement. We wanna come back to that idea of the feedback process. We know that when staff come together to do some learning, that we wanna find out what worked, and what could be improved so that we are continuously looking at how can we make that even better. And then we want to define that structure for self-directed learning a little bit better. We know that, that in education sometimes we see a pendulum swing and we don't want to see that we have a one-size-fits-all, everybody needs to do all of these things because sometimes people know some things and some people don't have a readiness for those things. At the same time, we don't want to say, anyone on earth, you can do whatever you want, because then we can't collectively move together. So we want to provide kind of an umbrella direction that you can tie your own individual <coughs> plan to, but something you feel passionate about and excited and ready to learn, and we can differentiate, but not everything under the sun. So that's where we're going to do some more work, is defining that structure for self-directed learning. So. In regard to staff development, what questions or comments do you have for me? So the, the PLC, if I'm a third grade teacher, McCullough, doesn't matter, but I'm at McCullough, does our PLC, can we, we can kind of come up with our own idea of what motivates us or drives us for that year, mm -hmm. but it should be tied to a staff development goal and or a building goal? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And I think there has been, in the past, there has been um, an ebb and flow of structure, and this year we gave a little bit less structure because some people felt, or the message that I heard is some people felt that there was really um, a focus to looking at data, and while data is important, week after week, you can't just look at numbers. You have to be able to talk about what do we do about these numbers and maybe walk away from those numbers and look at some text and what are some common practices and look at other teacher videos in order to reflect on what do we do differently. So we're, we're trying to ease off on the specific direction and at the same time, we still have to point in the same, we're all headed in the same continuous improvement, so those goals are important to drive where PLCs are going. Okay. In the K through four world, will there be time going forward, and I apologize for not being at the last meeting, yeah. will there be time allotted for collaboration between sites? So third grade teachers in the district can all have some time together. Yes, and that has happened this year already. Okay. On one of our staff development days, um, the principals, it, it, Mary and I meet frequently with the elementary principals, and we talked about how are we going to best use that time. And they did survey their staff and wanted to kind of divide up the day. And so we spent part of that day where they had some choice with some tech integration. Part of that day was designated working with your grade level across the district team, and part of that day was spent in their individual building PLCs. So we're trying to find that balance because some people really like their team, and they want to spend all of their time with their team. And some people really want to get outside of their team and hear some more input. So we're trying to find that place where everybody gets a little bit of what they want, but nobody gets all of what they want. So, yes. Yep. Yep. And. And then at the middle school level, or site, will there be the ability, and I don't know how long they're gonna be uh, having the push for Hattie's sort of backward design mm -hmm. stuff, but will there be more diversity next year in some of their 
uh, content choices, PLC choices, that kind of stuff, do you think? Um, I was just talking to Justin about that today, and what I imagine is going to happen there is, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a, there's a structure in place at the middle school to really think about how do we do continuous improvement based on research-based best practices. And the administrative team spent a lot of time over the summer grappling with what are the nuggets of the best stuff out there. And so they shared with their staff, here are the high priority items. And so they're beginning with learning targets. They're not looking at learning targets as write some words on the board and then move on, but really as a driver to here's what students need to learn in the class today, and that students should be able to tell you here's what we're doing, not just here's the task, but here's why and what I'm intending to learn. And then they know that we need to move toward formative assessments. And there are some groups who met um, this past Monday that already have begun to talk about formative assessments because they're well on their way with those learning targets. And through that, you're gonna find that teachers have different ways that they can approach formative assessments. So you might find that some groups are really looking at how am I gonna equitably call on students to make sure that they participate in discussions? Where some people might look at what kind of um, exit ticket or entrance ticket, what kinds of questions am I asking to elicit? What do kids know? And that's where we may see some choice and some diversity while it still fits under that umbrella of formative assessments. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. Is Are they getting feedback from the, now I know there's some groups there that might, like I don't know if the gym teachers are coming up with a formative assessment process or not. Well, right now it's learning targets and kind of the structure of outlining your their curriculum. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the departments should be able to do that because we want to have a plan for what we do from day to day, week to week. So their structure is... No, I, I know what yeah. the goal is. Yep. But I'm not sure some of the <coughs> departments are engaged as many as much as some of the other departments for different reasons mm -hmm. some legitimate some valid some maybe volitional and i think we find with any professional development that we do there are some early adopters who are ready and they're champions for it and some would drag their feet a little bit because they're wondering if it's a this too shall pass and you know i think the more consistent we are about that message those people will come on board and will continue to move in the right direction Cool. Any other questions or comments about staff development? I'm using my wait time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like your tweets lately, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's yeah, some a, interesting ones. There's a great uh, uh, Twitter chat that happens at 7 o'clock on Sunday nights, and it's called MN Lead. And it's a group of leaders around the state that come together around a topic each week, and it's led by one of those people. and there have been some really good topics lately. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about curriculum review. And what's in, the important message for me to share about curriculum review is what is it and what is it not? And the way that I work in curriculum review is that it's not about textbook adoption. Textbooks or resources are the very last thing we do in a curriculum review. So here's how I work. We again begin with that compelling why of our content area, and we look programmatically. So what I don't want is for a third grade teacher to come in and think only about third grade math, but I want them to look at the K-12 continuum of where is my pit stop on this journey for all kids, because we need to think about how does that work, and I think sometimes in education we forget that kids come to us from somewhere, and they go to somewhere after us, and. Um, we've talked about at one of the meetings that idea of implicit permission to forget. If I reteach something, I am assuming that they haven't yet learned it or haven't yet learned it the way that I hope that they will learn it. And sometimes we have to trust that it has been learned, do some assessment to make sure, and then move beyond that. So we begin with that compelling why. 
We need to build our collective knowledge of programming shifts and best practices, and I'll talk specifically about math and what we're doing there. We want to study some trend data, and the way that I like to approach studying our data is to start with a strengths-based approach. So when we look at data, I don't want us to focus on, oh, here's where we're doing bad and here's where we have to improve, but begin with what are those things that we do really well or consistently over time have done well, and what do we do to do such a good job there? And then when we look at those areas of growth, we can say, how can we replicate the things that we do strong in these areas where we have some growth? So people come into it and aren't heartbroken because we, we all know that teachers own their data and they feel really bad when their kids don't do as well as they want them to do. And so we need to start with, we know that they're doing good things. Let's highlight those things and look at how we can replicate that. So we look at areas of programmatic strength. So we're looking across the continuum, not specific to one grade as we begin, but you know, when we look at math, for example, number sense is an area where we know we have some growth to make, so we look at that programmatic. Um, then we need to determine our gaps in resources. So if we look at here's you know, what we do well and here are some things where we could do better. Is it the stuff that we need to help us do better? Is it more skills in our teaching? Do we need some more professional development so that we know how to do a better job? So we determine those gaps. And then we articulate our plan. And the plan is the curriculum. That's the curriculum, not the stuff. And then we look for resources that will support the implementation of our plan. So when we think about a textbook, we shouldn't go page one to page two to page three, because that isn't helping us um, focus on the student and what they need. Sometimes page one has to be done again and a little bit differently. Sometimes we can skip page two because they already get it. So we look at that plan, that outline plan, and then we figure out what are the resources. Now sometimes we have this dream list of what resources should look like in order to help us implement this curriculum, and they don't exist. So we have to mix and match and use what, you know, what is best out there. But the goal is for teachers to use that as their support in their craft of teaching and not necessarily be tied to everything in a textbook. That's how I operate with curriculum review. So we have two departments this year who are going through this process of curriculum review. We have Global Languages, and they started their process before I came on board. And we are so lucky to have t Tim Hasty Bamanick on board. And he and the high school Global Languages department just they gel so well and they think big picture and they were already on board with this idea of the why and the big picture before I ever came here. So Tim is really leading the process with global languages and it's easier because they're a department of one building. They don't have to think about outside of their building and they have time daily to look at it. So they have revisited some of their long-term goals of their program. They've done extensive research on best practices. They've gone um, to do some site visits. They have accessed some webinars and some conferences to really look at what's the next phase of global languages. Um, they've determined their high priorities in resources. They made a list of, all right, before we look at anything, here's what we want to see. And then um, they uh, had some resources, some uh, samples shared with them, and they were able to go through and say, yep, this one meets it, no, this one doesn't. So it wasn't, ooh, pretty pictures, and choose the one that has all of the bells and whistles, but they had criteria in mind before they began looking. And then once the resources are um, finalized, then they look at planning. What are we going to use? How are we gonna supplement? And that's how they're gonna spend the remainder of their curriculum review time. So they're really much more um, self-directed than probably any other group that I will work with because of their unique nature. So when we talk about math, uh, I invited a participation or a representative from each grade level at each building and a special ed rep from each building. We also have Title I involved. We don't want to have just one voice. We want to make sure that when we look at math, we're looking at those kiddos who can do a really great job with math and some of those students who struggle. And what do we do to support them? 
And then we talked about what are our program goals. So by the time a student graduates, if they're able to walk through our entire math program, what is a graduate from our math program look like? What do they sound like? What skills should they have? And then we also, much like staff development, use some text and video to enhance our understanding of what's the next step in math education. And one of the things that we see as a common thread in most of the things that are out there is there's a shift going on from a procedural understanding of math, doing the steps to get the right answer, to a conceptual understanding. So really kids being able to wrap their head around, what does this problem mean? And what of these many tools that I know about can I use to solve it? And most of us didn't go through a math program that had that conceptual nature. We knew the formula, we knew where we should plug in numbers, and we got an answer. And it was a good answer, and we moved on. And so this is going to be a pretty big shift for our teachers as we continue down this path. So I typically begin with having people draft a mission, vision, and values, but I don't ever tell them we're going to begin with a mission, vision, and values. I ask them some guiding questions, I gather their ideas, and then we don't spend time wordsmithing. I do wordsmithing and then I bring it back to the group so that they can really think about content and not words. So this is what they came up with. They know that math instruction is integral to students' lives because they become skilled mathematicians who demonstrate problem solving skills and behaviors. So they're looking beyond the computation to those skills that we want them to have outside of a math classroom. I have a problem, how do I work through it? So that logical thinking. By the end of their program, they want competent, confident, curious math students who demonstrate perseverance and are capable of describing their thinking. Many of those words that we see in that vision statement are, are uh, echoed in our Vision 2025's um, high college and career readiness standard. It's those, those uh, soft skills that we want of our kids so that they can transcend a math problem, but when I get stuck, I know I have some skills and I can keep working hard to get there. And then when we look at that last bullet, these are our values. So what are we going to do in order to create those amazing students we articulated in that second bullet? Well, in order for them to be competent, confident, and curious, they need to have differentiated opportunities so we know we can't do a one-size-fits-all. And they need to be able to uh, interact with math concepts together and authentically. So when we look at math, it can't be those problems that many of us saw, 50 of them in a homework assignment, but real life stuff that makes sense and makes them think about how does this work. So our next steps, because we've built that foundation now, our next meeting we're going to begin reviewing some trend data, and again with that strengths approach to begin with. We're going to um, look at what happens before and after my grade so we can continue to think about that program and not math as a discrete grade level class. We need to articulate what are our gaps in resources and determine our criteria for what are the ideal resources to fill those gaps and then build a scope and sequence plan that supports student success and then finally we move to those resources piece. We're kind of squishing math. It's a on our curriculum review cycle, and I'll show you that, I think, in two, maybe the next slide or the slide after that, it's usually a two, three year process. The first one is a review and study, and then um, we look at resources and make some purchases. Math was supposed to begin the review and study last year, and then this year look at resources. And although it's not ideal to kind of squish, we also know how finances work, and we can't say, sorry, we've got this budget and we can't use it, and now we have to do all of these things on next year's budget. And I'm confident that the um, teachers on the team are, they're ready to work and get to us to a point like that. So yeah, this is the slide of the curriculum review. So if you look at this, what I've highlighted in this box here is a big version of this, because on my screen this one was a little bit small. So last year, we were doing reading and language arts, and last year we made some purchases, and there's implementation. And we were supposed to begin with math last year. We're okay, we're beginning that this year. 
And then um, we've got Global Languages, who was also last year beginning, and then this year is supposed to be implementation, but they're going to jump over here. So we're, we're trying to weave where we were, where we are, and make sure that nobody gets lost on the cycle. But that's, that's how we came to be with Math in Global Languages this year. What questions or comments do you have for me about curriculum review? What do you see as the biggest challenges? Um, in what in particular? Um, trying to squish and get resources for math. Well, I don't see that's a huge challenge because I think they're, they're, the people who are on board are the ones who love math and want to talk about math. I think the biggest challenge is probably timing in that it's hard to get a lot done in an hour and a half chunk but we know that with the sub situation the way that it is, we can't pull out, I think I have 30 people on it. It's unrealistic to consider pulling out that many people for a half a day or a full day. So there's a little bit of homework outside of what we do, and that's the expectation. But when we come together, we have to really focus and, and make sure we knock stuff out. Are some of the metrics that the global languages people have developed to look at their resources, metrics that can be applied to other curriculum areas? You said um, they had metrics that they were right. using to... Right. It's unlikely because they talk specifically about what global languages need, and so you'll find in their chart or their graph um, the language involved and, you know, what sort of ethnicities there are in images in there, and that's not going to translate to math. But we, I think that with this, because it's not specific like global languages is, is we can talk about what are some general things. I'm not sure though <coughs> that it will transfer. And the reason I ask that is because when the last math curriculum was rolled out, I had kids who were in different levels of it, and the accessibility of the study aids for both students and parents was important. Mm -hmm. And they were already working, by the way, on the um, concept oriented mm -hmm. problem solving, but some people, it, it was critical to be able to access those study aids in different ways for the people who work differently and think differently. Mm -hmm. So I would guess that would be a huge... Across the board, yep. Yeah. Yep. To, to that same point, that's where I've seen having my two older boys go through the curriculum. My oldest is a senior now, so having seen this over the last few years and really see the accessibility via online resources from the textbook, via the extra efforts from the uh, teachers of the classes doing videos, going, you know, going the extra mile, utilizing, not, not just utilizing, in a lot of cases seeking out additional resources that they can bring to bear for their classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it wasn't that long ago, Schoology was just getting introduced and look in just a very, very short period yeah. of time how integral that has become to not just math, across the board to many, Absolutely. many different classes. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really, really impressed with what they've done with just getting started. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the, your last slide? Yes. Just to kind of, just so I can understand that is so all different departments are going through a curriculum review? Yes, and when you see those bottom three rows, the monitor and adjust, they're kind of in that holding pattern. They're still on the cycle, so we don't lose them, but there's not a whole lot happening with them during that, that time. What other questions or comments do you have? As you bring 30 people together to try to make a decision mm -hmm. or a recommendation, there are potential odds that 30 people won't come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Are you the final decision then? Um, that's a great question. I think, well, when it comes to making decisions, 30 people don't have to agree. I don't need our high school teachers to agree what our elementary people right. are doing so long as you know they can confirm this meets kind of that vision that we have. So it'll be smaller. And I think it, it really will be what are the merits that we're talking about and I love to build consensus and I think I pretty do a pretty good job of it. I think we'll come to consensus. So you don't, you're not that worried about it? No, okay. I'm really not. All right. 
I, I can just tell you that the staff development people feel good about the process you have them engaged in. Good. And it's good to see the in intellectual stimulation of the meetings. Yeah, there's really great discussion that also is productive. And, you know, it's not, we don't just sit around and talk about great things, but we talk about great things and we also get things done. And I think there needs to be that balance. It can't just be task. There has to be time to dream and plan and think big. And it's a good meeting between administrators and teachers at that level, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone is a colleague in that room. There isn't anyone who comes in and says, it's my way. Don't mess with me. So how are the the uh, teachers from all the different levels, how are they chosen? Do they volunteer, or is it? Is it... Um, this year, I think most of the people who served on the committee last year continued to be on the committee. And it goes out to building principals, and I ask them to work with their staff development team to see who wants to be there. And then as far as the math curriculum group, that again was principals push out this message that we need representation. And teams usually come together at the elementary level and say, hey, I really like literacy. I'd like to be the spokesperson for that. I'll take math. I'll take science. So there, there's usually a division of labor in that way. Middle school, we have you know, the department chair, and then it goes out to that department who wants to be involved, but we can't have everyone because, you know, there's a cost to it with our after-school meetings. So we put on limits of here's how many people we want, you decide. So I don't pick. They collectively say who's going to best represent us. Anything else? Okay, the final question, I don't think I have a slide for this one. Um, next, what, what do you want to know about in teaching and learning? So when I come back, what do you want to hear about? I would like to hear, uh, because I've, I wasn't able to get there yesterday, but I've seen it in action. Um, I'd like you to just share a little bit about how you work with our administrators and you try to guide them to maybe not an end that you want, but I know there's an end that you want, mm -hmm. um, but just how you give them professional guidance and leadership. I, I, just a little snippet on that. Okay. Not your, right now, but next time, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> your, your thoughts or yours and Mary thoughts on um, gifted and talented in Hastings and where you want to see it go. And that's been coming up mm -hmm. yep. with some of our discussions. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, uh, that's one of those emails that's being drafted in my head right now. Mm -hmm. We're smiling because yep. Jen, Jen had just come in and uh, met with me on Monday, I think, and just we had a, just a 20 brief, 20 minute brief conversation on that. Um, so, mm -hmm. so there will be things to report soon. <laughs> I'm happy to say in that world. All right, so those are the next two things. Awesome. Thank you for Thank your time you. tonight. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Uh, I didn't know Scott was going to be here. I didn't think he was going to be here, but it's uh, good that he is uh, here as well. And uh, Adam sits on the committee as well. Um, Andy sits on the uh, committee as well, but Andy wasn't able to be at our last meeting. But I will always have this item on about every um, three or four months. And every three or four months, I'm hoping that you hear the same thing a very short report that's very good and you'll be saying why does Tim keep putting this on our agenda but I think once we made the decision to go self-funded again it was important important to share this information with all of you and with, and with the public because it's, it's a big issue we need to make sure that we do have money um, to cover our health insurance costs now that we've gone self-funded so um, I'll just share a little bit and, and Scott can help uh, hop in again uh, but we had a meeting about a week ago. Um, I'll say that I'm very impressed with our consultant. I think he knows his stuff very well. Um, and he's also, if he doesn't know it, he, said, he doesn't try to answer it. He says to us, you know what, that's a good question. I'm going to look that up and, and get back to you. But um, very good report again. We're, we're healthy. Uh, we're healthy as an organization. We're continuing to put some money into our savings account, into the self-funded. Um, and if it continues on pace for the rest of the year, 
uh, we're going to be right where we right where we'd hoped to be. And it was definitely a guessing game when we went in. Our our dental insurance is a little bit off, but not bad. I think it's still going to be. Um, we came in a little bit hotter in the month of July than the previous year. And of course, we know that a lot of families, or the Collins family, you go to the dentist in July or August before you're heading back to, to school. But we, we did come uh, in this year a little bit up on there. But of course, uh, dental isn't as high as, as our health concerns either. But um, overall, um, we're sitting very well. At our next meeting, when I bring it up again, we'll have some numbers here. But I just wanted to give you a, a feel. And Scott, if you want to share anything else. Um, one of the things that we that we are always doing is we're keeping an eye on that next contract, on the next what's the next renewal going to look like, and uh, since we've been self-funded, kind of the, the percentages that we ask them to run are four, six, and eight percent increases. You know what what would it look like if on our next contract we increased our own rates, so what what the district is paying our portion and what the staff is paying in their portion, if applicable, uh, what does that look like at 4%? What does that look like at 6 What does that look like at 8 And then they play the what-if games and they, they, they run the various scenarios to predict uh, as best they can with our limited claim history where we, where we would land, you know, most likely here would be your renewal number. You know, here's what you're going to have to pay. Here's what you would be. Here's how you would be funded. Here's you know where that would go in terms of uh, where you would add to your add to your overall balance. So, with the numbers where they're at right now, we're looking at being at the lower end of that spectrum. Where last year we were looking at you know the six and the eight. And I need to temper that a little bit because industry industry trend is over 10%. So it's fantastic to even be discussing numbers less than 10%. So that's a huge win in and of itself. Uh, we've already, our, our, our balance is looking healthy. Um, we don't need to build it all up in two years, okay? It, it's, it's not something where we need to race to get to that number and then, you know, try to stick there. It's like, hey, we're, we're slowly building and you know, not wood. If if we have uh, people stay healthy, that that's good on multiple fronts. Um, so I, I, th I think we're in good shape. Good update, and that's again the purpose is um, I want to make sure that we as a board talk about it three or four times a year because we don't ever want it to slip to um, where we need to bail from it or take from the general fund or whatever it might be. So very good news. Um, Review the upcoming uh, public meeting, uh, the 27th. I know this might look a little bit weird or awkward to the public, but we don't work together. We don't get to plan together. Um, and, and I usually don't use a board meeting for this purpose. But it's something that I couldn't do via email or whatever. But I'm just going to tell you what I think is a plan. But if you as a board say, no, no, Tim, that's, <laughs> that's not what we want to do. Um, there's Just to let you know, too, there's going to be an article coming out in the Hastings uh, Gazette. Uh, just a little bit more about the declining enrollment of financial budget and you can you're more than welcome and invited to attend uh, to a more of a listening session on wednesday evening uh, january 27th and again i'm mentioning it here because i know that this is broadcast as well so um, anybody who wants to come to the listening session um, feel free to come on next wednesday but uh and then we're going to use our school connects uh tomorrow or friday dm is already crafted a very short message that will go out to all parents just saying, you know, next Wednesday, January 27th at 7 o'clock p.m., um, board members are inviting you to a, a, a listening session on what your thoughts are on the upcoming budget reduction. <coughs> Again, making sure that our public does know uh, in advance uh, about the meeting. Then my thoughts, uh, and Lisa Henderson, that's, I'm from Henderson originally, and I get their, my mom gives me their paper, so they did a similar thing uh, a similar listening session about a week ago, and it really was right what I was thinking of, and that is the superintendent just gave a very short update of the budget and where we're headed. Not really a question answer necessarily, just a, this is where we're at. Yep, yeah, just a recap. And uh, then board members be sitting at, you know, 
different tables spread out, and individuals sit there, and four to five people go to Lisa, four to five people go to events, maybe 10 people, I, I don't know. And you just have more of an intimate small group conversation because I believe the real purpose is not necessarily for everyone to come there and hear what your questions are, your concerns are, et cetera. It's, it's for you to give your opinion to board members. So is that how we're kind of, okay. Yeah. And that's, that's being exactly held right. at the middle school okay. at seven o'clock in the cafe, cafeteria. Um, and again, it's the board members wanting to hear from our constituents on what their thoughts are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if we don't have enough people for uh, seven, we can have two. Yep. Split it up that way. So. Okay. So we're. Good. I do think we should try to keep a list. Yep. Some kind of yes. list at the end so about all the concerns and ideas. Yeah. So each of you at that table would have a responsibility for okay. jotting down, and we turn it into um, Deanna. Just like I don't know who was at the middle school today, Andy, I think, and I don't know. Russ, Dan. Dan. if you could just send an email to Deanna, and she'll put all the sug suggestions, comments together for us. I took good notes. Okay. Um, and then just a very short recap of the facility meeting. I had a facility committee meeting right prior to this. We met for an hour, and I don't know if one of the board members wants to recap, or I could do it uh, real brief, too, just to update you as board members. Does anybody want to do it, or let me just roll? You go ahead and roll. Okay, okay then you guys hop in. Yeah. But part of t uh, tonight's meeting was just to educate the three board members on the facility committee, remind them again what is the uh, uh, long term facility maintenance revenue that's a change in the law, um, health and safety, deferred maintenance. We used to get that up over here to the side. That's going to become part of this new um, long term facility maintenance revenue. I talked with them about an abatement bond, something that Kim and I learned about from Springstead, where a district that cities used to be able to do this, or I have been able to do this without board approval, where it applies to parking lots. Uh, the board can bond for parking lot replacement. Don't ask me why, but it's an amenity to the city. And the philosophy is that let's pretend that. Um, Tilden was still a, a school and our staff were parking on the streets. By us being able to build a larger parking lot, it's an amenity to the city because the cars come off the street, it creates the neighborhood to be safer. So I just talked to them about an abatement bond and that we could do that as a board um, if we wanted to. I, I reviewed the different time frames of when we need to renew our operating levies in 2019 and 2013. And how are 23, 23, 23, 2019, 2023, um, and how our high school will be paid for at the end of 21. So we could go out for a well, we could go out before, but that 3.1 million dollars will come off of the tax base in 21. Um, we talked about a technology levy that lots of schools are going for. So we just kind of looked at all the uh, moving pieces to. <coughs> Um, and we're going to meet again next Wednesday prior to our uh, meeting in the middle school cafeteria. And definitely part of this then is to the next phase would be to bring in Scott McQueen from Wald. And then to talk about when do we want to maybe go for some of these things. And then we would bring back to you as a larger board some of the things that we've been talking about, what some of our thoughts are. And then I, I know that. Uh, you know, like Russ was in on that larger community facility planning committee about now six, seven years ago. I think it will lead to that um, to talk because facilities are big ticket items. So, um, and then we talked some, about some, I don't want to call them minor because I know that you get uh, calls, but we talked about flag poles at Todd Field. Do we want that to be our responsibility to say is a joint, it should that be a joint powers discussion about replacing those, et cetera. Um, we also talked about um, so just ones. kind of the, the smaller maintenance projects that oh, yeah. we anticipated for this year. So. Some of the, the maintenance projects um, that are going on and then um, our overall facility use for, for uh, students overall will be part of this facility discussion as we move along. So how we're structured um, with our facilities will get embedded in this discussion 
as we move along. So that's an update on that. And then I, I know that you board members um, have seen this budget review. And so I, I, it's not that I want to bore you, but for some of you it might be, oh, I didn't, I didn't pick up on that the first time. But I also know that this is televised. So again, it's a way for me to get this out to the public. And uh, Vince was able to go with me on a majority of my site visits. Lisa was able to go with me on two of my site visits. It gives you a feel for how I explained it when I went out to our site and some of the information that I shared with them. So again, this is for the listening public. <coughs> I'm gonna, uh, quick recap for you, but one of the things that I started out and, and several people said that this really hit home with them. So I used it then everywhere I went and I asked, and I'll ask you as board members, raise your hand if you graduated with a high school class of less than 400 in your high school class. Okay. <laughs> and that was very reflective of every site that I went to. And I said that um, 10 years from now, Hastings will have a graduating class of around 350. That we're gonna be fine. It's even though we have declining enrollment and it does impact our budget, 350 kids in a graduating class is a very good, robust, rigorous, diverse. lots of activity, diverse, um, lots of opportunity to participate. A decade from now, we're still going to have that in Hastings of what we have right now. In fact, I'd argue that 10 years from now, <coughs> your child would have even more chance to participate because there will be just as many programs and just as many opportunities and a fewer students to get involved in those programs. So we're going to be fine, but we need to um, massage, massage through that. And that everybody said, yeah, you're, you're right. We still will have that. And it definitely helped um, because Vince was able to share his personal story. I don't think he minds me sharing it. He said that his children, two older children, went through a great school district, and he strongly uh, invested and interested because he has a child that will graduate in the year 2032. 2032, <laughs> and he said, got another board member, Andy, whose children haven't even started school yet either. He's invested. There's other board members uh, that have children in school, so it's, the board is concerned. The board does want a great school district and we have high expectations, and even as we massage through it, as Jen said, we still want whatever the latest trend is for math. We still want whatever best practices is for math. So then I walked them through and said, you know, decline, I, I need to keep talking about declining enrollment because it is our reality. But we're, we've been going through it for 14 years. This isn't new. Every board I've ever worked with here has been going through it. And I said, but I'd, I'd hope by right in here it would be stabilized, and it's not. We're going to continue to decline. We're going to continue to decline for a few more years. But we've had that for 14 years, and we've been massaging it, we've been right-sizing, and we've been downsizing. And I said, we've been able to do it because in these years right here, our community <coughs> said, you need our help? We'll pass an operating levy. We'll help you out. And we, and we started building a savings account and we started to add back some teachers. Then right here again they said, you need even more? Okay, we trust you. You're gonna keep building your savings account for the rainy day that's coming. And we've done that. And we've kept class sizes low. We've closed Cooper, we've closed Tilden, we have kindergartners riding with seniors and juniors. We've been able to make some of those big changes and still have programs, still have low class sizes, and still compete. And the other day, just real quick, went on the MDE website just because I was I was curious, and and I only went back, you know, four to five years because you you can get all the data that you want. You could look at ten years, or you could look at fifteen years. And interesting, Burnsville, Lakeville. North St. Paul, Stillwater, Hastings, Red Wing, all have had declining enrollment, just like us for these last five years. Rosemont, Apple Valley, Egan, Randolph, South 
uh, they've had growth. But I'd, I'd say when you look at a Rosemount Apple Valley Egan, that's pretty stable. That's not a lot of growth for that size of school district. When I looked up South Wash, same thing. Ember Grove Heights, same thing. Just about stable. What was interesting in both South Wash and Rosemount Apple Valley Egan, if I would have gone back 10 years, then they would have had declining enrollment. So what happened in Rosemount Apple Valley Egan and South Wash was they started here and they declined in here. And in the last five years, they upticked just a little bit. So in the last five years, they've had a slight increase. But over the last 10 years, they've had declining enrollment. And again, I, I then looked at, at Randolph because as we look at the, the Hampton area and how many students are going to Randolph, um, Randolph over the last 10 years has, has increased their school district by 108. We've lost 537. And part of my point of that is not all of our students are going to Randolph. It's that we have people having fewer and fewer students. They're not going to Burnsville, they're not going to Lakeville, Stillwater, right? because they're all declining too. So we're not the only, part of my showing that slide too, this is new, I didn't show this at the, the site, but part of my response for showing that is other people do have decline as well. Farmington um, was probably the only school district in our area that over that 10 year period has had the steady increase. They've had, they've had the steady increase. Lakeville had it for a while, and now they've dipped the last five years. So then I talk about the fact that um, whenever I speak to the Rotary, whenever I speak out in the public, everybody says, well, if you have declining enrollment, then just cut. You should be able to cut staff. And that we do, we have been. Whenever anybody resigns, whenever anybody retires, we ask, can we do it differently? But it's very difficult. If a student is worth 8,000, and you lose 100 students, you've lost $800,000. And I talk about the fact if all 100 were perfectly in first grade, and they're not, but if all 100 could magically be in first grade, I'd cut four teachers, 25 kids for each teacher. Now we know that it doesn't work that way, they're spread throughout the district, so that makes cutting even more difficult. But if I cut four teachers, I could save $248,000 where do we as a school board, a school district, and a school community come up with that remaining 552000 And that's the tough part. And you usually come up with it by operating levies, which we've, which we've had. And then I, I share that this is the information that I share with uh, school board members. And I talk about the fact that, yes, we are going to have $12.6 in our savings account at the end of this year, and we're over this year we're over budget by 561,000, and if we do nothing, we're going to be 1.5 million over budget. We still have 11 million in our savings account, but our fund balance policy says we should have 7.5. We should have two about two months of operating expenditures. So even though 11 million sounds like a lot of money. We should always have about that in there. And that I have very difficult discussions with you about how much we should cut, how much we should reduce, and that you as a school board, along with um, my guidance and, and my expertise in financial management, has said, hey, you know what? We're not going to cut 1.5 million from our budget, but we are going to reduce it by, we're going to look to reduce it by 700,000. And then we'll have 11.7, and we know that we're over budget by 876,000. And then we'll get to see how many people retire, how we're able to restructure and reorganize as we get into the next year. And again, I, I talk about the place that we're in a much better place in a lot of districts, because a lot of districts don't have that rainy day fund balance that we have. So it allows us to spend down and that if each one of them owned a business and they were over budget by 1.5 million, that'd be pretty serious. If they were over budget by 200,000, that'd be pretty serious. But we as a school board collectively represent all the parents, all the grandparents, and we as a board have said, hey, we're not gonna panic and throw everything out. 
we're going to make wise decisions as we go along the way. And I think Vince and Lisa, as they were out on those, you know, site visits with me, everybody just kind of does what you did as a board. It's like, yep, yeah, well, thank you for the information, and um, we'll get through this together. And we all know it's not going to be easy because whenever you reduce a person, and it's, it's difficult. And I, I also shared some of the sites that we, we know there's a few places that we were going to reduce anyway. So when you have a, a, a small fifth grade class coming through, then you know the next year you'll probably have one less sixth grade teacher, and then the next year you'd have one. I mean, those are just some natural things, but it's still tough when you have to tell the person that um, they're gonna be out of a job. So uh, with that, as far as the budget cutting process, et cetera, I think we'll all look at the notes that you've had from the listening session and our work session in February is going to be, I cleared that we were going to have um, it be at one of the sites. I've decided just to have that be a work session and, and that be our topic for the night. And so Paul Baker, um, their site's going to be uh, another month. So, <clears throat> so we'll pull together with the principals, the core principals, and us as a big group on that evening. And we'll just start talking about what some of the thoughts are. Special ed too or not? Yep. Yep. Special ed, and I'm going to ask, I'm going to tell Jen and Mary that if that I see on here, we're going to be approving. Um, I think they might not be here that night because they're going to be at uh, some place warm at a math leadership uh, uh, seminar. So um, otherwise, Jen and Mary would be um, welcome to attend as well. So with that, we're ready for the action items. And the the timing on this is just not good. The first motion is <laughs> is is something that state law requires us to do. It's not because of Tim's presentation. It's not because of our current situation. It's because every school district in Minnesota has to pass this resolution, which we call the Dan Cater Resolution, yeah. <laughs> which authorizes I like to vote against this yeah, which <laughs> authorizes the administration to make recommendations, if necessary, for reductions in programs, positions, and reasons. Therefore, and Exhibit A was attached, um, but 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 basically it. It just authorizes, or it says school boards have to authorize their leadership to be able to do this if they're in a situation that requires it. And so that's why it's there. Yep. So we don't need to read that? Just uh, it depends on who makes the motion and how they make it. I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion, and I'll, I'll make it so that uh, I'll make the motion for the, um, for the resolution with the uh, reading waived. Unless I'm wondering. The whereases are interesting. They're very, you'd think the end of the world is coming. And, and uh, that's why I want the historical reason why I used to vote against this is when I came on to the board 10 years ago, we were in statutory operating debt. And we were coming, as we came out of that, you know, we were uh, building a fund balance, we were adding back, hiring teachers. Then we come on, it's really negatively worded, uh, you know. I, I just couldn't, yeah, negatively worded resolution, but so I prefer that the reading waived. <laughs> I'll second that. Roll call vote. Any discussion for oh. Discussion at all on the, on the exhibit, <coughs> on the motion statute? I'll just say I, st I still think the um, resolution itself is worded fairly negatively, but you know, I'll be supporting this this time because we do need to do reductions and we are going to legitimately do need to direct him to um, find areas for reduction. So it's a legit, it's a legitimate motion this year is what I'm saying. And your point on it being worded like the sky is falling is also correct. <laughs> Any other dis discussion at all on it? Okay. Roll call vote. Joe Becker. Agreed. Andy Bergstrom, yes. Dan Cater, yes. Scott Kurgan, yes. Lisa Dean, yes. Russ Roloff, yes. Vince O'Brien, yes. <clears throat> motion passed. Motion to approve a gift from Holton Mifflin, Holton Mifflin Harcourt uh, for Jen and Mary to attend the conference Tim was talking about uh, February 8th through February 10th. Motion. Second. Any discussion? 
Glad to have a positive motion. <laughs> I just want to share that this is at no cost to the district. Um, and it's, uh, again, I think it's very timely from the presentation we just had tonight because it's some math leadership um, conference. So. <clears throat> we need to get you back to Apple because you were, you were walking around with that iPad. Like, I didn't have time tonight. I was coming on, from one right. meeting to another. And <laughs> but now that two years ago, you just slipped on that. I don't know. I still use it. Okay. Uh, all any discussion <clears throat> on the Jen and Mary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. School board, school board committee structure for 2016. This is basically what you all asked for, within reason. <laughs> On motion. Second. Any discussion? Thank you for organizing this. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you all for participating in those committees. And we do have to come up with a way to have the committee's report better back to the board. Yeah. Like Jen's touching on staff development was helpful tonight, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And facilities certainly is helpful. Motion to approve retirement of Sharon Niebuhr. So moved. Second. Set. Any discussion? I just want to share that um, when she turned this uh, in, I walked down and I really thanked her uh, for getting it in, in a timely fashion because it really helps us as we look um, to restructure, uh, whether it be a teaching position, secretary, custodian, whatever. Knowing retirements or resignations months in advance really does help us uh, with good planning. So thank you to Sharon for doing that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Did, did we get the motion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Motion to approve a variety of leaves. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And, and and a resignation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'm just going to share that uh, this is really becoming a problem. Um, <coughs> I'd say not only for Hastings but for school districts because uh, OTs can make more money in the medical field than they can here. Um, PTs might be starting to enter that arena and. Um, we know that RNs are in, in that situation, speech and language is in that situation, and uh, Dave Haven and I have had several conversations, and you know, part, of the pro is, the part of the problem is this is required in an IEP. So it's written into an IEP that Lisa's son or daughter or Vince's son or daughter needs so much service of OT in a week, and then we can't hire somebody, and so we can't provide the service. And it's really a catch-22. We're, we're trying to hire. We advertise, and yet you want your son or daughter to have service. And we're for, fortunate so far, you know, we've gone probably, and whenever we get a resignation mid-year, it's more difficult to fill, even a tougher position, you know, mid-year. So I just want you to know as a board, um, Dave's been making contacts in South Wash, other school districts, anybody in the area, he's been asking some of our own um, OTs, would they do overtime? Would they do extra? You know, what what could they do? And now it's going to be where he's going to have to contract with an outside agency to provide that service for the remainder of the year. And I'm probably going to be talking to Julie Malm about OTs are on our teachers' contract, and within our teachers' contract, we say that you have to have a service in a similar field. So if Typically, if that meet would mean you had to work in another school. So if, if Scott was an OT for uh, Gillette's, that hasn't counted when he comes here for on the pay scale. So that we might have to be saying that for that, I'm going to be having a discussion with Julie that for maybe for this specific field and maybe PTs, that we might have to consider some outside experience. And Dave did contact 10 schools in our area and they sent us back. Uh, everything, how they do it, and I just I haven't had a chance to look at it real close. But from what my quick glimpse, only one school was like us. The other nine were all giving some level of credit for experience at Gillette's, uh, and he still thinks even after we do that, we still might struggle. 
the one thing that was uh, I I know we contacted some of the districts that are 917 because I talked to yep. the 917 districts um, last night uh, about this problem um, I didn't bring it up that it was a problem for 917 too right so I mean yeah everyone was kind of in the same boat um, you know some were struggling with the OTs some with the PTs some with the SLPs but they're all having that same type of issue and um, yeah there's usually they're on the teacher's contract plus something you know seems seem to be the norm so yeah we're probably gonna need to evaluate this so anyway I just want to let you know that's gonna be an upcoming um, discussion also Dave did a very nice job of a communication piece out to the principals and to the parents of the students with the service or lack of service telling them why and that we will be contracting um, with an outside agency to provide that service. So as I felt his follow up and follow through with parents, principals, uh, et cetera, um, was very good. So. Great. <coughs> okay. Uh, did we accept the resignation? <laughs> no, we're not gonna let this person leave. Because we need them. <laughs> the vote didn't occur yet, but the vote didn't occur. Yeah, the vote didn't occur. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Motion to approve the employment of many people. So I think one person must be a candidate for a first grade for replacing two teachers at the time of the year. Yep. Couple, yeah, Three none of these are none of these are additions or replacing teachers that retired mid year or, or vacancies. I'll second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes and a recall of an employee. A motion. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We've got some meetings coming up and some dates. Any questions, issues? We have a motion to it. So February's work session will be here now. Yep. February's work session will be here. I move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed?